Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and this is my wrap-up for September. But wait, you might say, the month isn't over yet. Well, my outraged hypothetical viewer, I'm not going to finish another book this month, so I may as well do the wrap-up now. This month my reading has been surprisingly contemporary. Three of the six books that I read were published in the 21st century. Three. I feel like a time traveller. But before we get to the books, here are my usual shout outs to three small booktubers that I have been enjoying particularly this month. The first child I want to mention is Alex Black. Alex has been putting out a lot of really amazing content lately, from uh, really well thought out and well presented review videos, there's hauls, vlogs, and um, one of my favourite formats, which is top five lists, like she's done the um, top five crying books and top five underrated YA reads and things like that. Alex has a really wonderful presence on screen and I like that she's very quiet, very calm, but confident and always full of really interesting opinions on books. The next channel I want to recommend is Summer Dawn, uh, whose channel is a wonderful mix of literature and musicals. One of my favourite recent videos of hers is a discussion about the character of Sherlock Holmes and how he's been portrayed in adaptations of the Sherlock Holmes novels. At the moment she's doing a series of musicals that were inspired by books, which is just wonderful too. Uh, she always puts a lot of effort into her editing and as a result her video is always quite fun and upbeat and a bit quirky just like her. My last shout out goes to Linos from The Lilac Linnet. She has just returned from her booktube hiatus and I'm so happy that she's making videos again. She's only just started her channel back up after her break, so um, there aren't a whole lot of very recent videos, but her two most recent ones are both tags and I've been enjoying the answers in both of them. Her reading tastes are quite different from mine. She loves historical fiction and cosy mysteries and things like that. But the books she talks about are exactly the kind of books that I want to explore more. So her channel is really good for recommendations for things that I'm hoping to discover. And now for the actual reading wrap up. In September, I read six books with an average rating of 3.5 stars. The first book I finished was Red Sister by Mark Lawrence. This fantasy novel follows a young girl called Nonna, who at the beginning of the book is saved from the gallows by the abbess of the convent of Sweet Mercy. Nonna was about to be hanged for murder, but instead she follows Abbess Glass to the convent where she starts her new life as a novice. Since this is a fantasy novel, the education at the convent consists more of martial arts and deadly poisons than prayer and contemplation. The book follows her over a number of years, where in addition to her classes at the convent, she also has to deal with the other novices, she makes friends and she makes enemies and has to fight some dark forces as well. In other reviews of this book, it has been compared a lot to Harry Potter and the similarities are not accidental. There's a magical boarding school, there's um, a central character who has suffered abuse and neglect as a child who then enters this magical school. Um, there are teachers with dubious motivations, there's even something like the four Hogwarts houses represented in the four blood heritages of the novel. And yet it doesn't read like a knockoff at all. The thing that drew me in at first was the setting. I grew up around nuns. My mum worked for a convent for my entire childhood, so I've always been around nuns and broadly speaking, I like them. Of course, the nuns in Red Sister are a bit different and trained to be assassins and mages. The first line of this book is quoted in almost every review of it because it gives such a perfect depiction of what a nun signifies in the world of this story. So I'm going to quote it here as well. It is important when killing a nun to ensure that you bring an army of sufficient size. For Sister Thorn of the Sweet Mercy Convent, Lano Tassus brought 200 men. If that doesn't make you want to read the novel, I don't know what will. Red Sister hits all the buttons for me. The plot is fairly slow moving. It's a long book and it has some gorgeous prose and a really fascinating setting and world building. One thing that really stood out to me is that almost every character in this book is female. Obviously being set in a convent, there isn't much space for men in the story except 
as outsiders. And I found that a very refreshing break from the usual overrepresentation of men in novels. Overall, I gave this book four stars and I'm definitely planning to continue the series at some point. Next up, I continued my reread of the Sherlock Holmes canon with the novel The Valley of Fear by Arthur Conan Doyle. I've been listening to these stories on audiobook and this one, like all of the others, is beautifully narrated by Stephen Fry. That is until we get to the slightly dodgy Irish and American accents. This is not one of my favourite Sherlock Holmes stories. I wish the cats stopped making such a noise. This is not one of my favourite Sherlock Holmes stories. The novel is split in two parts, with the first half being the actual mystery, and then the second is the background story of the killer. Doyle used this format in A Study in Scarlet as well, and it just doesn't work for me. The mystery was fine, if a bit predictable. The characters were fine as well. The setting was suitably mysterious and atmospheric, so I'll give it that. And the backstory of the killer was also just fine, if a bit predictable. I can only really recommend this novel if you're already hooked on Sherlock Holmes and haven't read it yet, because otherwise it's just fine, and I gave it three stars. The next book I read was Persuasion by Jane Austen. This was Austen's last completed novel, and it was published in 1818 a few months after her death. I read it as part of my 1818 novel project in which I read and review novels that were published exactly 200 years ago. That means I have already done a separate review video of Persuasion, which you'll find linked up here and in the description box, along with the rest of the 1818 playlist if you're interested. Um, so if you are interested in my detailed review of Persuasion, then click the link to that video and watch that. Otherwise, let me just summarize the book briefly. It follows 27-year-old, scandalously single Anne Elliot, who suddenly ends up in the same social circle as a man that she rejected years ago. I enjoyed this book very much and gave it four stars. Then I read the latest release by J.K. Rowling, which is her crime mystery, Lethal White. This was published under her pseudonym Robert Galbraith and is the fourth book in the series, which follows London-based private detectives, Cormoran Strike and Robin Ellicott. In this instalment, which is set in 2012, they investigate the blackmail of a government minister, a case that soon turns to a murder investigation. Robin goes undercover at the House of Commons, while Strike investigates a left-wing activist group who are trying to disrupt the preparations for the London Olympics. This is a big book, so I'm not even going to try summarize all of the subplots and minor things that happen within the 650 pages of the novel. Oh, I haven't even shown it to you. Look at that. It's a big book and there are a lot of things going on, but at the very core of it, I think this is a book about privilege. One of the core figures is the um, conservative Minister for Culture, and we get to know him and his messed up family pretty well throughout the book. The things that they take for granted and the power they are able to exert over other people based on their family's wealth and social status, that's a major theme in the book. Especially when this is contrasted uh, with, for example, the character called Billy, who's a young man from a difficult family background, struggling with mental health issues, that lead to him sleeping rough on the streets of London and with no one paying any attention to him. Sometimes I found the politics in this a bit too heavy handed, especially when it comes to the depictions of the left wing activists who are across the board depicted as hypocritical and clueless, which kind of glosses over the real actual issues that left wing activists try to address. Another theme that's explored within the crime mystery plot is family and relationships and exploitation of other people through relationships. The relationship between the two main characters, the detectives, is given a lot of screen time in this, as is the relationship between Robin and her husband Matthew, as well as the various relationship that Strike has with other women, his girlfriend Lorelai, for example, or his ex Charlotte. Um, then there are the couples at the center of this mystery. There's lefty activists Jimmy and Flick, the culture minister Jasper Chisel and his wife Kinvara, there's the sports minister Della Wynne and her husband Geraint and so on. I can't really go more into the plot without spoiling the mystery, but let me just tell you again, this is a very big book and it moves through the plot quite slowly. 
A lot of my favorite parts of this are not action-packed and tense, but instead are everyday slice of detective life kind of scenes like Robin's undercover work or conversations in the car on the motorway or late night text messages between the detectives when a clue has been uncovered. These bits make this my favorite strike novel so far and I gave it four stars. I can really recommend the Cormoran Strike series, but I would urge you to start with the first book called The Cuckoo's Calling and then read the books in order until you get to Lethal White. A lot of the character development happens over the course of the series, especially when it comes to Robin, and it would a little bit be like reading the Harry Potter books out of order if you start with Lethal White. Next, I continued with my Sherlock Holmes reread and listened to His Last Bow by Arthur Conan Doyle. This is the shortest collection of short stories, the fourth one to be released, and it's from 1917, although some of the stories were written earlier. This one mainly stands out for its title story, in which Sherlock Holmes comes back from his retirement as a rural beekeeper in order to thwart the German Empire's military espionage plans and basically single-handedly disrupts the outbreak of World War I. That one's a bit weird. The other stories, though, are basically fine. Uh, Doyle's writing gets a bit more refined in the later books, but at the same time, the plots get a little bit less original. Um, but there's a lot of nice flowery descriptions and quick-witted dialogue in this collection, which I always enjoy. This was another three-star read, and again, one that I would recommend if you've already read and enjoyed some other Sherlock Holmes stories. The last book I finished this month was The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. This was a weird little book. It tells the story of a seven-year-old boy living in rural Sussex and the strange adventure that happens around one of the neighboring farms. This is told as a flashback, so the little boy is now a middle-aged man who's remembering those events. In terms of genre, this is quite odd because it's definitely fantasy, but it has got elements of horror. The narrator and main character for most of the book is a child, but it's definitely not a book for children. I think it would be most accurately described as a modern, dark fairy tale. Um, I'm in two minds about this novel. I enjoyed the writing style and the atmospheric setting. Neil Gaiman is very good at observational writing and there are so many passages about childhood and memories that read really beautifully. On the other hand, I didn't really care about the main character or the adventure that he goes on, the plot of it, basically. I felt like this book started with an idea of atmosphere, with this sense of creepiness and with this setting of an ancient farmhouse with ancient people living in it. And then those ideas got kind of forced into a narrative that didn't really need to take up the 250 pages. Um, that it took, but it totally would have worked as a short story. So I'm giving it three stars because I still mostly enjoyed it, but I'm not going to be rereading it. This was the first Neil Gaiman book I ever read, and it definitely made me curious to explore the rest of his writing as well. So these were the books that I read in September. Uh, here's my tally for my curated bookshelf project. Out of the six books I read, Three were audiobooks, that's the two Sherlock Holmes and the Red Sister book. I listened to that on audiobook as well. One was a four-star hardcover, that's Lethal White, so I'm going to be keeping that on my bookshelf. And one was a three-star paperback, that's this one, and I will be giving this one away. Also this month, I don't really have a non-book favourite. There wasn't any particular product or item that I've particularly loved, so I'm going to leave that one out for September as well. This was it for September. October is going to bring a lot of Victorian literature because it is Victober, so I'm going to go back to my natural habitat of the 19th century and I will see you all there. Thank you for watching. Bye.